Der Hintergrund für diese Abendveranstaltung ist, wie Sie wissen, der, dass wir heute wieder eine Exzellenzprofessur der Petersen Stiftung verleihen. Wir machen das seit 2010. Heute wird die 16. Exzellenzprofessur hier verliehen. Und äh, bei dieser Gelegenheit möchte ich gerne die Vertreter der Stiftung begrüßen. Einerseits Herrn Dr. Wichmann als den Vorsitzenden des Vorstandes und Herr Dr. Zöllner als Geschäftsführer der Professor Dr. Werner Petersen Stiftung. Ihnen ein herzliches Willkommen. was mich besonders freut, auch Vertreter des Vorstandes, des Kuratoriums und die Stiftung sollte hier gut vertreten. Und äh, wir werden heute, das kann ich Ihnen versprechen, einen interessanten Vortrag hören. Aber ich möchte bei der Gelegenheit, äh, would like to extend a very warm welcome to my special guest tonight, Professor Susan Lozier. Um, Susan is a Professor of Ocean Sciences at uh, Duke University in the US. Uh, she is a physical oceanographer by training. And she's going to talk about um, exploring the ocean's overturning circulation and its impact on our climate. Um, I'm switching to German again. Um, Stichwort Klima und Klimawandel. Der neue Präsident der Vereinigten Staaten, Donald Trump. I'm going to, I'm going to be busy here. <laughs> Ähm, hat sich ja geoutet, äh, nicht nur als Klimaskeptiker, sondern als jemand, der den Klimawandel nicht akzeptiert und den Klimawandel als gut inszenierte Lüge bezeichnet. Und äh, hat gesagt, dass es in der Vergangenheit immer Regen, Wind und Sonne gegeben hat und dass es in der Zukunft auch Regen, Wind und Sonne geben wird. Die Frage ist eben nur, wie viel und wo wie viel. Und ich glaube, dieses feine Detail hat er aus den Augen verloren. Und wenn es dazu käme, dass die Forschungsförderung in den Vereinigten Staaten sich im Klimawandelforschung zurückgefahren würde, da für die Weltraumforschung stark ähm, in Richtung Förderung aufgeforstet würde, dann würden wir, glaube ich, ein Problem bekommen. Dann würden unsere amerikanischen Freunde und Kollegen ein Problem bekommen. Und wir können hoffen, dass die Berater des neuen Präsidenten das verhindern. Also das gibt wahrscheinlich für alle Politikfelder, die er dann zu beackern hat. Also ähm, wir bleiben gespannt und ähm, der Schock ist, glaube ich, immer noch äh, bei einem Präsident. Ja, also nochmal ähm, herzlich willkommen. Ähm, wir haben ein kleines Programm hier entworfen und der nächste Programmpunkt wäre Herr Professor Biersdorf, der die Laudatio, die Citation auf äh, Susan hält und danach werden wir hier den entsprechenden Preis äh, übergeben, die Exzellenzprofessur, die mit 20.000 Euro immerhin dotiert ist und dann den Vortrag hören und dann haben wir noch Gelegenheit, uns draußen bei einem Übungs- und Getränk etwas auszutauschen. Herr Kollege Wiersdorf. Okay, I'm going to switch to English, back to English. Uh, dear student, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to give the laudation for Professor Susan Doja, I mentioned this formal title now, on the occasion of her receiving um, of an ex Peterson Excellence Professorship. A little bit, a few words on her background, just to give you an impression of her career. Susan studied chemical, chemical engineering, not physical oceanography, and that's what I've learned as well. Um, chemical engineering at Purdue University, West Lafayette, I, I looked it up, <laughs> Indiana, and the University of Washington in Seattle. And I think it's at the University of Washington where she switched to physical oceanography and uh, went into a PhD, which was awarded in uh, 1989 at the University of Washington. The title of the thesis still sounds familiar to some of the people in the audience. It's called Lagrangian Signatures of potential vorticity in a quasi-geostrophic ocean. The others don't, don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> she then went um, to Woodsoul Oceanographic Institution, a major observational institute at the west coast of the US, um, as a postdoc, first of all as a postdoc, but is still there as an affiliated scientist. And then went um, to the Duke University in 1992 as a professor, where she raised up uh, from an assistant to an associate and full professor, and now holds 
a prestigious, um, distinguished professorship. Susan is a widely cited researcher. She has more than 80 publications in peer-reviewed uh, international literature, uh, served and led several national and international committees, and educated a number of graduate students and postdocs. She also received numerous um, honors during her career, and among just a few, um, she's fellow of the American Meteorological Society, fellow of the American Geophysical Union, of the American Association of, for the Advancement of Sciences, and she's current president of the Oceanographic Society. She will soon receive um, this year um, the Ambassador Award, the, which is the highest award from the American Geophysical Union. Now, this is an impressive CV, and it's, uh, it's of course a result of, of her scientific achievements in different fields, mainly physical oceanography, but far reaching out into climate science, biogeochemistry, even going into biological applications. A substantial part of her career she devoted to the study of the Meridian overturning circulation, the so-called MOC. This system of Atlantic and even global-wide um, surface and deep currents is part of the, what we know, or what is widely known as Great Ocean Conveyor Belt that shapes climate on the Earth, which is a major uh, it's, an, it, it's a major um, ocean heating um, process. For us, of course, the most important part is the gas stream system, which, which brings um, some heat to Europe, not necessarily today. And the overturning um, is driven by, as Professor Herzig said, also already wind, sun, and rain, which is certainly true. Um, so from, from the atmosphere and ice <coughs> system, all components which are continuously subject to change and certainly at risk under global warming. So it is quite clear that, it, that an improved understanding of the overturning is quite crucial for the better understanding of the climate system in general. In the recent years, Susan raised the state of knowledge on that overturning circulation by synthesizing her own work, different aspects, um, of, from physical oceanography, challenging existing ocean theories, right, even reaching back to the most famous oceanographers like Henry Stormer, and integrating all this into a coherent picture of the functioning of the overturn and its role in the climate system. This picture is of course never complete, and it uh, was probably a very logical step for her to identify and use the identification of the open gaps to move and motivate uh, an observation program in the subpolar of the land and concentrate on that important part of the world. So sh that she in initiated and leads um, the multinational program OSNAP overturning in the subpolar of the land. I'm pretty sure you'll hear more about that. Apart from the pure scientific achievements, Susan is a great science communicator, which is important for us today. Um, I had the pleasure to follow her February talk at this year's Ocean Sciences, uh, held in Berlin, where she fascinated with that topic uh, a wide audience, a few thousand scientists from relatively broad range of disciplines in marine sciences. So, Susan, I'm very excited um, and look forward to your talk, and congratulations to the award. des Geomar Helmholtz Zentrum für Ozeanforschung Kiel sowie der Dr. Werner Petersen Stiftung sprechen wir Frau Professor Susanne Luther, Professor of Ocean Science, Nicholas School of Environment at Duke University USA für ihre wissenschaftliche Leistung und auf dem Gebiet der Ozeanzirkulation und zur besonderen Anerkennung aus und würdigen dies mit einem Preisgeld in Höhe von 20.000 Euro. Kiel, den 10.11.2016. Congratulations. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Okay. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, perfect. So, would you like me to take this? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. yes. 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 The money comes later. <laughs> <laughs> that is fine. That is fine. Um, so, vielen Dank, Arna. Uh, vielen Dank an die Professor Dr. Werner Peterson Siftung. Um, ich freue mich hier zu sein. Es ist eine Ära für mich. Ich kann nur ein bisschen Deutsch sprechen, so the rest of my talk is in English. Thank you. The focus of my talk this evening is on the ocean. Now, centuries ago, thoughts of the ocean summoned perhaps some feelings of fear, awe, and certainly some mystery. But for one man, thoughts of the ocean summoned curiosity. So I'm going to take you back to 1751. And in 751, a British sea captain named Henry Ellis was captaining a British slave trader, which was transiting from West Africa to the American colonies. And midway in the tropics of the North Atlantic, this captain stopped because he had been asked by a British clergyman named Reverend Stephen Hales. He'd been asked to take measurements of the deep ocean. Now, this was several decades before the Gulf Stream was charted by Benjamin Franklin, postmaster of the American colonies. But this Reverend Stephen Hales was very interested in the ocean. And he was aware of some temperatures that were being taken at the surface. But nobody had any idea about the temperatures of the deep ocean. So Captain Henry Ellis had a wooden bucket. And he had sawed off the bottom of the wooden bucket. And he fitted both the top and the bottom with valves. And he attached a very, very, very long rope to that wooden bucket. And he made successive draws over the side of the ship with his crew to capture, when they pulled the bucket back up, it would capture water at certain depths. And so there, in the very hot climate of the Atlantic, the ship had, had stopped. The sails had been drawn down. And they made the very first temperature profile of the ocean. And in his letter back to Reverend Stephen Hales, Henry Ellis, the captain, describes how each time they lowered the bucket and, and brought the water back up, they had a small thermometer of Mr. Fahrenheit's made by Mr. Bird. They would put the thermometer in the bucket, record the temperature, and then lower the, back, the, water ba the bucket back further, further, uh, deeper. And he wrote in his letter, he said, the cold increased proportional to the depth until the bucket reached 3,900 feet. And no matter how much further we lowered the bucket, the temperature was always the same. And that temperature at the time was 53 degrees Fahrenheit, because they were measuring a thermometer of Mr. Fahrenheit's. It measured 53 degrees Fahrenheit, and the air temperature at that time was 83 degrees Fahrenheit. So having dutifully recorded every temperature at every depth that they measured, at the end of the letter, Henry Ellis wrote, at first, this experiment seemed to us mere food for curiosity. But we've discovered that we're very happy to have found a cold source of water to cool our wines and cool our baths <laughs> in this vastly disagreeable climate. So they, just, they found a use for science way back then. They could enjoy that, the cool water and cool wines in that, in that hot tropical climate. That letter was sent on to the Royal Society of London, where it sat for 49 years. So in 1800, Count Rumford, some of you may know Count Rumford because he's considered the father of convection. There are Rumford fireplaces, so he's the one who uh, understood about heat and its convection patterns. So Count Rumford came upon this letter in 1800. And upon reading the letter and looking at the data, he was very puzzled, because he could not figure out how the deep ocean in the tropics could be so much colder than the air temperature. Now, prior to that, at that time, they thought there was no movement in the ocean, that the deep ocean was just still. The, the mariners, the sailors, of course, understood that the surface of the ocean was moving, we had the trade winds, and everybody was moving everywhere. But the deep ocean was considered very still. So Rumford could not figure out why, if the air temperature was 83 degrees, and they never suspected that the air temperature got to 53 degrees, how did those waters get so cold? And so in 1800, based on that one measurement of the, of the temperature there in the Atlantic, Count Rumford surmised 
he said, there can be no other supposition that, that those cold waters must have originated from cold currents coming from the poles. And he said, so if that cold water at the poles, having been exposed to the air where it's cold, that water has come down and spread here into the tropics, he said that we must have warm water at the surface that's returning to the high latitudes. And so in two sentences, Count Rumford, from one single profile, from one single profile um, of the temperature, he described what we call today the meridional overturning circulation, but as Arna said, has popularly been called the great ocean conveyor belt. And what Rumford even understood then was the importance of this overturning because he understood that this was a way to bring cold water to the equatorial regions and warm water up to the high latitudes, thus offsetting the differential hitting of the Earth between the equatorial regions and, and the high latitude regions. Now, that it took many, many decades later, though, before we had a fuller understanding of the movement of those water masses. So, Rumford was just supposing that there in the tropics at depth, the cold water must be coming down. But it was the German expeditions in the 1920s which really connected the waters from the high latitudes to those in the tropics. And so, Wust, or excuse me, Mertz and his student Wust were aboard the Meteor. And in the 1920s, they did what's called a hydrographic survey from on the Atlantic, from here 60 north all the way going down to, to 70 south. We're looking at depth, and we're looking at a cross-section of this ocean salinity. And what I want you to see is that these waters, this, from these Arctic waters that surface, are spreading here um, and filling the deep uh, at North Atlantic here. And in fact, these deep Atlantic waters that originate here at high latitudes not only fill the tropics here, but they go on and fill much of the global ocean. So today we understand in our modern ocean about 90% of the deep waters in the global ocean originate at high latitudes in the North Atlantic. So the German uh, oceanographers have a proud tradition of over a, almost a century now of um, producing measurements uh, in the North Atlantic. And these certainly were the first ones that were, that were making the connections. So since this time, many oceanographers transited across the Atlantic and other basins making maps of temperature, salinity, and oxygen that gave a real spatial context to how these water masses were moving throughout the ocean. But it was really in the 1970s when we began to understand the temporal context of the overturning circulation. So what you're looking at here is, again, a cross-section. So we're looking at depth from the surface of the ocean to depth. Here's the bathymetry. And now we're looking at contours or concentrations of tritium and its byproduct, helium-3. So in the 1950s and 1960s, both the United States and the Soviet Union um, were conducting nuclear bomb tests. And byproducts of that nuclear bomb testing is tritium and its decay product. And so those products heretofore were not in the ocean. And so what we see is that everywhere, those products, those that hit helium and tritium-3 were being taken up, tritium and helium-3 were being taken up in the surface of the, wa of the water. Um, but what we see is this encroachment or this penetration at depth. And this is the overturning of the conveyor belt in action because these surface properties are being brought down into the deep North Atlantic, because in that high latitude of the North Atlantic, where the waters are subjected to very cold winters, they lose their heat, they become very dense, and they mix all the way um, from, the, from the top um, almost to the bottom. And they create what we call a deep water mass. And that water mass is very dense, and that water mass spreads in unique uh, and complicated ways to the rest of the global ocean. But here we're seeing, from the 1950s to 1960s, we see the penetration to this point. So this really, for the first time, gave us an idea of that action of that, of that conveyor belt. And so we started appreciating the ocean overturning, or excuse me, started appreciating the deep ocean as a reservoir for heat, in this case, as a reservoir 
for these radioactive byproducts. But we understood then if whatever is at the surface of the ocean and can be absorbed by the ocean, that overturning is going to bring that quantity down to depth. So this had a real impact then when we, st when we started looking then um, in the 1990s at the amount of anthropogenic carbon dioxide in the ocean. So let me take you through what we're looking here. So again, we're looking at from the surface of the ocean to depth, and we're looking along a path, along, along this path. So we are starting uh, in Iceland, so you can imagine that you're on um, a ship, and you're going to start in Iceland, and you're going to come all the way down to the Southern Ocean. You're going to move eastward up the Pacific to the Aleutians. So here is Iceland. We're going all the way to the Aleutians. And along the way, you're going to be measuring in the water the amount of anthropogenic carbon dioxide. And what we see here, again, is the action of the overturning circulation. So we see that the upper oceans, what we say, are ventilated. They've taken up that anthropogenic CO2 that has been put into the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution. But we see that where it occurs at depth is in the North Atlantic. And so understanding that the ocean was a heat reservoir, we understood that. But now we understand that the ocean is also a reservoir for the carbon dioxide that's been put into the atmosphere. And the, the measurements are such that we now understand about 30 to 35 percent of the carbon dioxide that's been put into the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution is stored in the ocean. Now that's stored in the upper part of the ocean and also um, in, the, in the deep ocean. So, in addition to um, wanting to understand the overturning and its variability so we can understand about the redistribution of heat in our climate, we now have an added motivation because we're very interested in understanding the degree to which the ocean continues to take up that carbon dioxide. So the understanding, though, the uh, fate of the ocean as a carbon reservoir depends on our understanding of the overturning variability. Now, granted, at the surface of the ocean, the uptake itself depends on ocean biology, it depends on ocean chemistry, and it depends on ocean physics. But the mixing of that carbon dioxide to depth and the export of that to the deep ocean, it's all about the physics. And so we want to understand what controls that physics? What controls how much deep water, how much deep mixing there is each year, and how, much, how that impacts then the overturning uh, circulation? So how well do we know that overturning circulation? So if you had asked me this 10 years ago or 15 years ago or when I was a student many more years ago than that, I would have said, well, we know the overturning circulation quite well, but I would have told you about what Count Rumford told you. I would have told you that the overturning circulation depends on how much deep water we form in the North Atlantic. Those waters flow along deep western boundary currents, very prescribed pathways. That water upwells somewhere in the distant uh, Pacific or Indian Ocean, and then it comes back via surface pathways to the North Atlantic. And this overturning circulation, this conveyor belt model, has been used to describe millennial scale changes in our climate. So paleoceanographers have used changes in the, in the overturning circulation to describe how there has been large scale cooling and warming over, over the atmosphere. But always there was this divide between the paleoceanographers who were looking at changes on thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, and physical oceanographers who were interested in changes on years to decades. But in the 1990s, there was a study um, that looked at changes that were recorded, atmospheric changes that were recorded in ice sheets in Greenland and ice sheets in Antarctica. And that study found that there was a disruption of global, global air temperatures that happened on the order of years to decades. So this shook everybody up because we had thought, and, and they, they ascribed those changes uh, to the overturning circulation. So this was quite a surprise. Um, and so the terminology of abrupt climate change, uh, people started talking about the possibility of abrupt climate change because the supposition was that 
the overturning circulation, if it slowed down or even stopped, would create very large changes worldwide. So starting 15 years ago, since this uh, study came out, institutes and universities and agencies on both sides of the Atlantic started a very intense study of the overturning circulation on timescales of years to decades. And a lot of, um, you heard a lot of news about the um, possibility of abrupt climate change. And at that point when we, and this is when physical oceanographers, not just paleo oceanographers, became very interested um, in the overturning circulation. But at that point, we were still using the model, the conceptual understanding that the paleoceanographers had. Right? And so what I want to talk to you now about is some of the assumptions that we have been overturning about the overturning circulation now. Thank you for appreciating that small. <laughs> um, and these are three assumptions. There's a number of them, but I, I wanted to explain these three. So, um, 10 or 15 years ago, we believed that the, this conveyor belt or this overturning circulation, that we knew where to look um, and measure the lower limbs, so those waters that were flowing from high latitudes along the bottom. We understood that they were being channeled through the deep western boundary current. We also understood that the surface Gulf Stream waters are what were providing the upper limb of the overturning circulation to return back to the high latitudes in the Nordic seas. And we also have a strong, had a strong understanding that the overturning variability, this large scale overturning variability, is really driven by the changes at high latitudes in the North Atlantic and how much of that deep water we're forming. Right? So what I want to do is just go through each of these assumptions and tell you how these, the new observations are challenging our assumptions about these. So the first assumption comes from, as Arna mentioned, a theory from the 1950s from a physical oceanographer named Henry Stommel. And from this theory, not from any observations, um, Henry Stommel looked at the mathematical um, set of equations. And from um, his mathematical calculations, he um, conjectured that if there is a mass source, so if there is water entering into the North Atlantic, say there's water formed in the Nordic seas, that the interior flow must all be poleward. This is to satisfy some dynamics that we call potential vorticity dynamics. But all of the equatorward flow uh, must be along a well-defined boundary current. And so after Henry Stommel put out that theory, oceanographers went out in their ships and they found that deep western boundary current and believed then that they could measure the overturning, the deep limb of the overturning, by looking in that boundary current. But starting um, from some measurements that were taken by German and American and Canadian oceanographers um, in the 90s, a colleague um, of mine at Woods Hole, Amy Bauer, the two of us uh, wondered whether that was true, whether the lower limb of the overturning circulation could be so neatly divided into this uh, southward flow, and then everything in the interior would be, um, would be would move equatorward. And so we conducted an experiment um, using what are called RAFOS floats. So what you're seeing um, here, each of these um, is a schematic of a glass-filled tube that freely drifts with the ocean currents. And as they drift, these listen to a sound signal that is being produced by a moored sound source um, by sound, this instrument is a pressure transducer that sends out a signal once a day. Um, and these floats listen to this one and three others. They can triangulate, and then their positions can be tracked. So we went off uh, the, the um, coast um, of Newfoundland here, at what's called a Bonavista station. So here's the Labrador Basin. And we went right into this western boundary current. And over three years, released floats every three months. This is now over, over 10 years ago, uh, in cooperation with our Canadian scientists. So the expectation was we're going to put these floats in the deep western boundary current and track the lower limb um, of the waters. And what we found by looking at these um, is not exactly a pipeline of flow. We're looking instead at what we call a spaghetti um, a flow. So here are all the initial locations of the floats, and each one of these lines represents the trajectory or the path of that float. 
And so the colors along the way show the change in the, in the temperature. And so what we found was that there were a few floats that followed the expected route, but most of those floats went rogue and hardly followed that expected route at all. And so we began to understand that even the deep ocean is highly variable, filled with eddies, and that that theory that was in 1950s was, was making an assumption that the dynamics were governed on very large scales. But when we include the small eddy scales, we get a different picture for the dynamics. And so why we're interested in this, we want to know when that heat and carbon comes down into the deep ocean. And we want to understand how much of it is a reservoir and what the fate is of those waters. We need to understand uh, the pathways. So the next assumption that we um, have looked at is the assumption about the surface pathway. So Arna mentioned that the Gulf Stream carries the warm waters uh, northward. And what we're looking at here is very much a schematic of the surface waters in the North Atlantic that has been put together by hundreds of surface drifters. So um, many countries have put out surface drifters um, in the North Atlantic, and they float around following the currents. And these can all be gathered together, averaged, and looked at the overall pathway of how the water is moving. So in this study Dave, by, done by Dave Frattentoni 15 years ago, we see this red ribbon. And with this red ribbon is what we think of as the upper limb of that overturning circulation. So here are the waters that have returned from the Pacific in the Indian Ocean where they've upwelled. And these waters need to go back up to the high latitudes of the Nordic seas where they will overturn and come back at depth and also in the Labrador Current. So this has been an understanding that here are the Gulf Stream waters. Here is their extension in, into the uh, North Atlantic. And the, the consequence of this is something that was known for a while and was written about um, by Matthew Fontaine Murray, who was a, a US naval captain uh, in the 19th century. And um, as far as we know, or at least as far as the Americans know, he was the first one that talked about the impact of the Gulf Stream on European climate. So here we see a map of the sea surface temperature. Red is very warm. And then we have the cooler colors here. And so the very sharp difference between the waters off the Canadian coast and the waters off northern Europe and British Isles is ascribed to the presence of the Gulf Stream. Because here are the Gulf Stream waters coming up. And then those waters lose their heat because the westerly winds come across across the North American continent. Those warm waters give up their heat and moisture. And that moisture and heat then is delivered to the British Isles in northern Europe. So the Gulf Stream and its variability has always been a, 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 of interest in terms of how it establishes the climate in the mean and the regional climate. So that upper limb of the Gulf Stream has been assumed to be um, this part of the, of the overturning circulation. Now, it so happens that if you take all those surface drifters, those hundreds and hundreds of surface drifters, and instead of averaging them all to produce these um, uh, pathways of flow, instead if you just look at their pathways themselves and plot them, if we look here, everywhere where you see um, a gray asterisk is where a surface drifter was deployed. And what we're plotting are all those that were deployed south of this line, not we, I'm sorry. This is Elena Brambelli and Lynn Talley 10 years ago. Um, south of this line, all these surface drifters were deployed in, right, in the surface waters. One, one trajectory found its way here, got lost somehow. Um, but all of the others stayed in the subtropical ocean. Now, when this was put out, this was quite surprising because we were expecting these waters to flow up there. Now, there's a number of reasons why they don't. But one of the main reasons that we're just beginning to understand is that it isn't the surface waters of the Gulf Stream that provide the warmth here, but it's the subsurface waters that provide the warmth. So we still have subtropical waters moving up to subpolar. But the upper limb, the, the structure of the upper limb, is also um, under some revision. So we have 
our lower limb and our upper limb, based on these new observations, we have to think anew about how that overturning circulation is structured. But the main question we're trying to understand is not so much the structure, although we know and love the structure. The main question that we really want to understand is this third assumption, which is that based on paleo data, um, we believe that the overturning variability, this large scale overturning variability, depends primarily on what's happening at high latitudes in the winter, how much deep water is, is being formed. So here is another schematic, and we're looking at this upper limb, these warm color ribbons or the waters of the upper limb leading into the Nordic seas. Um, and then the cooler colors are the deep waters coming down across the sills in the subpolar basin. And we have water formed here in the Labrador Basin. And here it is um, exported. So we want to understand if the ocean will continue to um, be a reservoir for the carbon dioxide. How much will that heat that's carried back to northern Europe, how much can we expect that to carry? So we want to understand, well, what causes that, that variability? This question is very much of a concern to climate scientists, not just physical oceanographers. So if we look at the latest IPCC uh, assessment, the fifth assef assessment report that was put out two years ago, what we're looking at here is a time series of this overturning, the Atlantic Meridiana overturning circulation at a particular latitude. And we're looking at the transport, so the, the strength of that overturning as a function of time, all the way back to the start of the Industrial Revolution up to 2300. Um, nobody will be around, I suppose, to know if this is right or, or right, or we won't be around to know if they, how correct they are here. And we're looking at two different climate scenarios. The IPCC, when they um, make their assessments, they usually look at four different climate scenarios because we don't know exactly how much greenhouse gases will be emitted in the future. But in these rather conservative scenarios, we see that starting at the end of the 21st century, we see a decline. We also see a wide range um, in the estimates of the AMOC. Um, but we see that decline in both of those um, scenarios. And the reason given for this decline is a disruption, a diminishment of the Atlantic Meridiana overturning circulation. Now, the good news is that n now um, the climate science community believes it's very unlikely we will have a rapid change, that there'll be a rapid shutdown. So all of you can sleep at night. Um, I'm still not sleeping because of the elections, but I'm not, it's not a problem, not a problem with the, with the overturning circulation. But it's very likely that it will weaken. And on this scale, we say, oh, well, it will weaken from 2,000 to 2,100. But we want to know more than that. We want to know, will it weaken in the next decade, and by how much? And this is what we don't know. So the climate models, these large climate models, can give us a very broad view of the overturning circulation. But they can't tell us what will happen in the next decade or the, or the decade after that. And we care about that because overturning changes, the overturning doesn't have to stop in order for it to have an effect. It has to change in order for there to be effect. It will change the amount of carbon dioxide the ocean takes up. It will change the amount of heat that the ocean will deliver. And that amount of heat has been shown, has been linked to hurricane frequency. It's been linked to precipitation changes in northern Europe. It's the amount of warmth going to the northern uh, climates has been linked to changes in the ice melt as well. So there's very many reasons for us to try to understand how this overturning um, is changing. So we have the climate models that are suggesting that the changes in the overturning are due to these high latitude changes in the deep water formation. But we don't yet have the observational linkage. And here's one of the reasons why. This work, also done by scientists um, at Guillemar, and I think um, um, Jürgen Fischer may be here. Jürgen may be here. I'm not sure. But Jürgen Fischer and Johannes Karstensen um, contributed to this work, and Marcus Stingler um, as well. So the Germans um, have uh, long 20 years of measurements in the Labrador Basin. And those, um, particularly an array here of instruments at 53 degrees north, they also have um, had occupations um, up here at 56 degrees north. But though these measurements have given us a very good idea of what we can expect 
about the changes in the deep western boundary current, that overturning, and changes in deep water formation. So again, the expectation would be that if we make things colder, right, we would have an increase in the overturning, right? And that's always how the paleo data was interpreted. So what uh, Jurgen and colleagues uh, found was that when they looked at this mooring, K9, which is here, we're looking now at the different instruments at different depths, 200 meters to 2,800 meters. And we're looking at the strength of those currents over this 20-year period, and we don't see any change in those. Little changes here and there, but no large-scale change. But why we would have expected a change, because over the same time period, the temperature of the Labrador seawater was increasing. And so if the temperature of the Labrador seawater was increasing, we were making less Labrador seawater, we should have diminished or decreased the overturning there, but there was no change there in that deep western boundary current transport. So this, coupled with other observations, has led us to believe that we need to have a better understanding of linkage between what's happening at high latitudes in producing these water masses and the overturning circulation, because the observations to date, either we don't have enough of the right observations or we aren't, we aren't seeing the linkage that, that paleoceanographers have assumed there are. So when I have talked about this before, people have said to me, Susan, you're telling us all that we don't know, so I do want to tell you what we do know. We do know some things, thankfully. Um, we do know that the waters throughout the global ocean are filled with waters that were once at high latitudes in the North Atlantic. We know that those waters um, upwell, Many of them um, in the Southern Ocean via wind-driven upwelling, others upwell via mixing in the Indian and Southern Ocean, South, South Pacific. And we know that they find their route back to, way back to the North Atlantic via very circuitous surface pathways. We know that the energy that's needed for that upwelling of those cold waters is provided by tidal and wind mixing. And we know that the ocean, that overturning of the ocean, is providing a good fraction of that poleward heat flux that is warming the high latitudes. So in partnership with the atmosphere, it's offsetting the strong differential heating of our, of our climate. But we don't know the variability of that and what we can expect in the decades ahead. And why this matters is because we believe that as the climate is changing, that if the high latitude waters get fresher, meaning less saline, they'll get less dense, right? And if they get warmer, they will also get less dense. And so that means there will be less mixing. And that's exactly what the climate models are predicting. The climate models are saying, if there's ice melt, if there's warming of the high latitude atmosphere, the surface ocean waters then will be less likely to overturn, so we will have a weaker large-scale overturning circulation. So what I'm, what I'm showing here is from the US National Snow and Ice Center in gray. We're looking at the Arctic sea ice extent. This is seasonal. This is the average over the decade 1981 to 2010 decades. And we see in all these years since 2010, we have much less sea ice extent. We're also looking here at the ocean temperature anomalies. This is the ocean temperatures of the Arctic in the 1970s. And we're looking at the anomalies from the 1990s minus the 1970s, 2007 minus the 1970s, where we see red, the ocean temperatures are warmer. So we have every expectation that our ocean waters are going to continue to warm, they're going to get fresher, but we want to know what the response is. And so because of that open question and the impacts that we think the overturning variability has, the international community um, came together and formed a program called OSNAP. This is Overturning in the Subpolar North Atlantic Program, an international program. Um, and the um, US and Germany here, scientists um, at Guillemar, Johannes uh, Karstensen, and Jürgen Fischer um, are partners in, in that program. We have UK, Canada, Netherlands, France, and China are all partnering with this um, on this program. So what we're looking at here, here's Greenland. And we're looking here at the Labrador coast. Here's the 53 North Array. Again, what I mentioned is the German array that's been there for 20 years. And so we used that as an anchor um, for our, the rest of the program that we put in. So we've 
have uh, moored arrays here. We have instruments on both sides of Greenland. Every time you see, a, every place where you see a red dot, we're making measurements at those depths. We have instruments on both sides of the Reykjanes Ridge. This is a German array. The Germans also have some moorings here with a US array, a US array here. This, these, the UK has put in instruments here. The Dutch have instruments on this side of the ridge. We have more uh, US moorings over here. And then we have UK contributions over there. The Chinese are contributing a glider survey that is uh, measuring the waters. This is an autonomous vehicle that's measuring the waters here where it hasn't been so easy for us to put moored instruments. So the purpose of this array is not so much monitoring, although we are monitoring the changes in the overturning circulation, but what we're really trying to do is to try to understand the conceptual link, the mechanistic link, between what happens when we form water, high latitude, have the deep mixing here at high latitudes in the Nordic Seas, and how does that impact our overturning circulation? So this was all deployed over a series of five cruises in 2014. And just this past summer, another five cruises, um, ships were out and pulling up the instruments, redeploying them. And so we now have the data in hand, and we expect to have our first results um, next spring. It takes a while to, to, to work on all that data. So we'll get our very first picture. Now, I will say that as we move forward, we don't expect that we're going to be able to see a tremendous amount in two years. It's going to take some time for us to understand the variability. And this is where modeling becomes very important. Because this, all of this, this is very expensive. It's very expensive, and this is one of the reasons why it took all these different countries to do it. But what we want to do is provide some ground truthing and then work with the modelers such that moving forward, they, with the modeling, if they can ground truth their models with our observations, moving forward, we may have a few measurements in place. And then having those assimilated in the model, that can give us some long-term monitoring. But we're not in the position to do that yet. But now it's very important for us to work with the modeling community in order to understand how we can do with fewer instruments, but also what the circulation looks like elsewhere, because we can't measure elsewhere. And so if we can have this very intensive array here for a while, and the models can reproduce that, we start having more faith that we can use the models to look at the whole ocean circulation. So our hope here is that as we move forward, we're working both with the observationalist and with the modeling community to get a better picture of this overturning circulation. So since from 1800 to just for about 200 years, we had the same conceptual understanding of the overturning circulation. And it was very much what Rumford described from that single measurement. But a lot of that conceptual understanding came from our view of the property fields of the ocean, which are much easier to measure than the velocity field. So when we started looking at the velocity field, when we have the German observations from the 53 North Array, when we were looking at the pathways from the Lagrangian floats, we started getting a very, very different picture of the, of the overturning circulation. So those observations have been very critical. But what those observations have helped us understand the structure of the overturning circulation. Well, we want to understand what the variability is. And we want to understand what the variability is because the climate models are showing us the slowdown but we don't yet have that strong, that strong linkage. So the ocean community, as I mentioned, has come together uh, to work on this. And I, I will say that I mentioned that it's very expensive. And that is one of the reasons why it's taken an international community effort. But actually, the more important reason is that many countries on both sides of the Atlantic have a lot of decades of experience and expertise in the North Atlantic. And so it really is to understand this overturning circulation and its variability, it takes a, a community of ocean scientists working together. And this is one of the reasons I'm very grateful to the Peterson Foundation, because I'm able to come here and work with Arna Biestock and Klaus Boning and Johannes Karstensen and Jurgen Fischer and Walter Zink as well. And what, by having those uh, interactions, it helps us collectively move forward our understanding, both from a modeling and observational viewpoint. And so I think that in, Count Rumford had an 18th or 19th century understanding of the overturning circulation. And with our 
21st century technology and our 21st century international uh, collaborations, we will soon be able to develop a 21st century understanding of the overturning circulation. Thank you very much. Thank you.